So, Miss Tracy Holland, uh, you have quite a varied past. We have a lot of kind of similarities. I've spent our you know, time in the restaurant world. Uh, <laughs> you've started many businesses. Yeah, I'm going to ask you all about your, the trials and tribulations of that. You've, you've started many businesses. You've helped other people start businesses. But do you believe in the concept of failure? In, in what context? Believe I, it, like, does you, it happen? Is it okay? I just, for me, for the, the way that I look at it, and I guess what I'm trying to lead you into is saying that you have pivoted so many times and kind of had to weave your way through, you know, different avenues. And a lot of people are afraid by that or intimidated by that. And, you know, what is, what is failure really? You know, it's just an opportunity to kind of make a left turn and, and figure something out, which you have done so well. So I just wanted to know what your concept of failure was. Yeah, what, it's so interesting because we have one life right here. We're in this, on this path. So it's like, I liken it to trying to rush to get onto an airplane, right? You know, those people who sit by the front door and they're like, I'm going to get on, I'm going to get on first. And you're like, I, you have a seat. <laughs> Why are you rushing? <laughs> Go have a Starbucks. I don't really think about it as failure only because like short of death, right? Which I think means like game over other than that how can you call it a failure you're like a delicious soup with all these delicious like if you put in black beans this time and next time you use kidney beans and you try to figure out the most delicious soup it's just like going to get better and better how can it be a failure but i think that pe people are afraid to put those extra ingredients in <laughs> right so how do you get them? How do you coach them over that hump? Because you're obviously great yeah, at mentoring so, people. Yeah, I think, you know, what is interesting about fear, which I think is different than failure. I think what's interesting about fear is it's really the thing that holds us back from being our most expanded self. And that's fear of being rejected in love. That's fear of not being successful in a business. That's fear of getting on stage in public speaking. That's fear of trying a new business opportunity that you may not know works or does work. So coaching people through fear and how to overcome their own worst case scenario is a lot of where I spend my time. But I think what's interesting to me is the idea of failure. I... I really struggle with thinking about it as a bad thing because it's just like the most delicious soup. It's like, the only thing I would say is if you can't, you can, there's no possible way to hindsight how you could have done it differently, mm -hmm. right? My favorite movie, have you ever seen that movie Sliding Doors with Gwyneth oh, yeah. Paltrow? Sure. It's the difference between yes and no, yeah. Right? Is that not the best movie of all time? She gets on the subway. She doesn't get on. The door closes. The door doesn't like her whole life. But like, did you see the end? I don't want to spoil it for people. Oh, I mean, it came out like 20 years ago. <laughs> if you haven't seen the movie, go watch the movie now. But you can spoil the end because it's a classic. So where she ends up is in the exact same place. Do you remember? Yeah, of course. She ends up in the same place. That's my whole point about getting on the airplane. You can stand there and get nervous and anxious and be first and like stand in front of the guy and say, I take my ticket first. I want to get on. Man, you're getting on that airplane, babe. <laughs> You've got a spot. It's all going to be good. <laughs> right? So at the end of the day, it's like, you got to just embrace life and take it for what it is. And I've been... You know, I think some people, I've been divorced. Some people could say that's a failure. I spent 10 years with a great guy. I had three amazing kids. He's a great, he's on to his next relationship. I'm on to my next relationship. I'm happier than I've ever been. And so I don't think of it as a failure. It's just like a chapter. Mm -hmm. And fear is what keeps people from be being their most expanded selves. Right. So, so fear is the big thing in the room. That's the big juggernaut. Right. So if that's something that you work on people with all the time, who worked on that? Was there someone who taught that to you or where did you inherently learn that? Or would you just kind of have a natural inclination to, to fearlessness and just say, fuck it, I'm going to just jump in. 
No, I spent my first 40 years on the planet white knuckling it, mm. which is the same thing as fear to me. And when you white knuckle it, you're never going to think like a powerhouse because you're always going to be pivoting into like control and worry and sleeplessness and miss the joy of the moment. Right. So I don't think that, um, I don't think that it's, I think we can only teach what we've learned, mm -hmm. right. Because we're people who have to experience things before we can share it with others. So my passion in helping, especially women figure out how to live their most expanded life is only because I spent the first 40 years white knuckling it and have had six very, what from the outside, what people think of as a very successful life, successful business, income, whatever it may be that the measure is at the moment. But it's like, it's only been in the last six years that I've learned how to let go of the rope, to be in the moment. Meditation has been a huge uh, pillar for me. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what's that tipping point? What was that tipping point or that aha moment for you where you just, like you said, you weren't, you let go? Let go of the rope. Um, it was probably a combination of like three back to back things. One was a divorce in which I spent millions of dollars to transition out of that relationship. And I, that was the whole irony, right? Like I had to pay, write a big check to transition that relationship. And that was painful because I had spent so many years working so hard to get to a place where I had enough money so I could then go enjoy my life. Of course. Don't you love that? Oh, I'm going to go on vacation when I can afford it. I'm going to go do this thing when I have more money. I'm going to go spend time with my kid. Once I make my first X millions of dollars, then I'm going to have that freedom. So I worked my ass off for so long and I missed out on some really great stuff. So that's my white knuckling aha there. I spent money transitioning a relationship out. Um, and then I spent about 18 months doing the same thing with a business relationship that I had with my business partner and buying him out. That was a very challenging period of time. Millions of dollars of transition. And then coming to the other side of all of that and realizing I had been focusing on the wrong thing um, and that joy and happiness and peace of mind and spending time with people that I adore and who encourage me and fire me up and make me feel good. And for those listening, like if you're not waking up every single day, jumping out of bed, like your son, like, woo, like, what do we get to do today? <laughs> if that's not the feeling you have, every single day, then it's a moment to take a pause and figure out what you're putting as your priority ahead of that and decide if it's really worth it because that white knuckling feel, feeling, that experience is, a, is depleting. Mm. It's paralyzing. Yeah, of course. It's paralyzing. It's paralyzing. And so meditation is a biggie. I think spending time with amazing humans that raise your vibration and really help you to think outside the box. For me, a pillar is wellness and exercise. And I think of like extreme sports or kind of, I like, I like physically moving my body into a place that I didn't think I could go. That's epic. Um, yeah. And just playing and yeah, I love your attitude about just getting up. And for me, I've always been just foolishly optimistic. I've been, I think I was the opposite of my first 40 years. I was not white knuckling it. I just, I had some crazy, like I grew, I grew up in the middle of, you know, in the Midwest and I was a professional dancer and I never for a moment thought I wasn't going to be successful in that. And then I went through a shitty divorce as well. And I remember thinking, because I got married when I was 21 um, and I got divorced right before I was 30. And I remember in my 20s, I was like, oh, it's going to be so easy when I get to 30. It's going to be chill, probably have a kid. And then of course, everything gets completely turned upside down. But now I feel like I'm white knuckling it more now with that fear of like, oh, I am 40 now. I, I feel like I, I'm putting much more expectation on myself, um, even though I have a high in, in, intense expectation on myself. But now it's like, 
I'm like, oh God, I have a child. It's th-. you know, there's there's all of this kind of anxiety that's now coming up in me. So I'm, I, I'm just, I, I'm, I need you to coach me now. <laughs> so Dean, tell me what you're anxious. Like, what is the thing that keeps you up? I think it's just you know, especially as a man, and you have a or you know, or a woman. I guess it's just you are now, especially at this point of your life, thinking about legacy and thinking about what you want to leave behind and what what model do I want to be for my son, and what kind of parent do I want to show him that I am and, and what kind of love and how much do I want to set him up for the future. So I think it's ever since having a kid, um, it's been the most incredible feeling, but also it's, you know, shit got real. <laughs> so. It really did, didn't it? It really did. And you know, the beauty is they come through us, but not from us. Mm-hmm. Right. So they're our teacher as much as they are here to learn. And you'll find that as he gets older, Mm. even more so. And it's such an amazing thing to experience. If you choose to have more children, Mm -hmm. you will also see between the the different children, how different they are. Right. Right. But I do think what you're touching on is so important because what you're talking about is time versus the legacy of having spent it in a way that you feel is well, well, right. Mm -hmm. Where you're spending your time doing the things that really matter versus just kind of letting things fly by. Yeah. It's intense. Well, you know, speaking of children, though, how, how do you balance? And I'm sure this is a question that, especially as a a woman, a female entrepreneur is how do you manage having three kids? No, running your own business, also mentoring others. Like it's a lot of, it's a lot to navigate. It is a lot. I think, you know, um, my, I think as women, we think that we have to choose a lane, mm. you know, be full-time mom or businesswoman, or, you know, and that there's this idea that there's not enough of us to go around. I, I really do believe that once our kids hit a certain age, they're somewhat more independent than we realize. Our our goals, like I think about bowling. Do you ever go to the bowling alley and ask them to put those rubber things up so that you ensure you hit all pins down? <laughs> I like I bowled. I I got like a perfect score. Well, it's because I put that rubber thing up. You know, I kind of think of raising kids in the same way. Like I I don't know if we're really as impactful. Once they hit age nine, 10, 11, that tipping point is they're emancipating, they're, they're individuating. And I, all I can say is my, my littlest guy, he's 10. And every time he comes in and says, mom, can I sleep with you? I'm like, yes. And then I just stare at him. I just stare at him while he sleeps. And the truth is because at 10 to 11, at age 11, boys start to realize they have penises, right? And then girls start to realize they have, you know, their own um, independent, you know, sexual, uh, I don't know if it's sexual, but it's um, like the hormones start, right? So they start realizing that they want to change in the closet. You know, they don't want to come out while they're, you know, they don't want you to see them in the shower, you know, nine to 10 is a tipping point in Mm -hmm. which all that I want to cuddle with you. And will you sit in here while I take a shower and read your book? So I don't, you know, like that disappears literally within this weird one year period. So now that I've had three and my littlest one has, he's just on the tail end of, can I sleep with you? Mm -hmm. I like keep a journal. I'm like, oh, I got one more night. <laughs> I'm trying to balance that because my son now, he he used to just, he we lowered the crib, he's two and a half. He's like in the real, you know, big boy bed. And he, it's so hard now to keep him out of my room. And it's not, a, even though I love having him and I just try to cherish those moments. So I'm glad that you're still cool with the, the, the sun coming in into your room because everyone's like, no, don't let it, it's a slippery slope. Don't let him come in. And it's just like, I just, I love having him right there. It's, it's, should uh, just nourish and l- like 
soak up every second you can. Yeah, and it's funny too because now he's it's we'll shower together, <laughs> so it's like a little like it's like a frat house. We're just kind of in the shower, like it's like a sports team. But it's I'm like, beautiful. I'm not gonna be able to do this. Like you can't do this when you're 13. It's gonna be a little weird. Oh, absolutely not. And that's the wonderful thing is you're teaching him to feel good about his own body. You're connecting with him in a way. I just think all of that. I I loved every second of raising kids, and I would just say that the idea of you know, can I be successful? Can I run a business? Can I raise children successfully? Am I being a good mom? I've, the one thing I do is I do have house help and I have since the very beginning, I have been very fortunate in delegating household responsibilities from grocery shopping, laundry, cooking, cleaning, uh, errands. And I don't think it's reasonable to think not that you can do all of that, right? So allocating my time to the things that are most important, which is spending time with the kids, quality time where I'm really present mm -hmm. and then doing business related stuff and being really present is the key to success. And I would nurture every second you get to shower with that kiddo. I know, it's so sweet. Um, so did you, what did your restaurant time teach you about uh <laughs> about business first of all mexican food is the best <laughs> restaurants in the world to work for um i liked i loved being a waitress um i worked at a steakhouse for a period of time at the western boot steakhouse steaks by the way filet mignons are a little hard to carry because they they're like baseballs they roll right off the plate <laughs> so after my like fourth flying filet, I got fired as the waitress and got promoted to floor manager, which is like winning the lottery. Failing upward. You're just failing upward. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. But you know, I think everything makes sense because I don't know about you, but it teaches you how to be front facing to your customer, how to read the room, how to be intuitive. I think everyone should have to work in hospitality or be some right. kind. Yeah, I, I was talking to an actor the other day about this, about how, you know, we're so used to, we're conditioned to going into rooms and auditioning and being told no. And it just, it conditions you to kind of just get comfortable with being you and especially something that's client, you know, uh, facing and you have to deal with all sorts of different personalities. It really does set you up for success in, in all your business interactions. A hundred percent. And I have to say, I would take home some serious loot. I mean, there were multiple, multiple times I got $100 tips on like a $30, $40 bill. That's amazing. So I was, I, and I was always so grateful, you know, and my bus boys knew where the hustle was coming from. So they always took care of my tables first because I would tip them out and they would be like, Tracy's my sugar mama. I'm going to, I'm going to go hang out with her. <laughs> so what did you learn as the GM? What, I'm sorry. What were you, what did you learn? What were your lessons um, from be, or being the manager? You know, you're a man, you went from, you know, f you know dropping stakes on, on the floor to, you know, running, running the floor. Yeah, that was rough. I have to say, um, I realized <clears throat> that was my first experience managing people that were a lot older than I was, mm. which has been somewhat something that I've done the rest of my life from that moment forward. Um, but that was a tough experience because what station you assign to which person, you know, certain stations are obviously highly productive. But other stations are kind of like the back of the room and nobody wants in that, that station. Um, I, I learned a lot about managing people. I learned how to schedule them, give them breaks, how to motivate them, how to problem solve. You know, someone would come to me and say, Lorraine did this and that. I'm really unhappy. And then I'd have to smooth everything over. I mean, it was actually the best training. Yeah, mitigating a lot of disasters is what uh, you end up doing a lot in the, in the restaurant world. I know firsthand, it's a lot of- totally. It's, it, it, and it sets you up, I'm sure, for having kids, too, because one's talking about the other one and you're like, oh, I just have to smooth things out and, and make sure everybody stays happy because you want people to show up because there's nothing worse than if someone not showing up and then you have to pick up the extra. Oh. And you know what I loved the best? 
I loved those regular clients who would come in with a $20 bill in their hand and shake my hand and say, Trace, it's so nice to see you. And I'd say, your table's ready. (laughs) So you learned a lot about that. Walk me through the launch of your first business. I was in grad school. Mm -hmm. It was actually pre-grad school, but then I was in grad school and um, I went to grad school by day. And then I worked like I, every single business I would work, I would do it literally a day job to keep the income flowing. And then I would start my business nights and weekends. And so my business partner and I did that. It was with scented nail polish. Uh, She was the chemist product development inventor of the formula, brilliant woman. And I went to school by day. She worked at the FBI doing uh, like CSI kind of work. So she literally was on murder scenes and, you know, trying to look at blood spatters and figure out how things, how things went by day. And they're looking at paint splatters and nail polish by night. <laughs> yeah, no, she actually worked for the DOJ, the DOJ. So wow. she was a DOJ. Uh, yeah. So she was a total badass, And, um, we did that. We built this thing and I took Columbia student loans and helped to underwrite inventory because at that time I was fortunate. My parents were helping me pay through uh, for grad school. And so I applied for student loans. I didn't really understand how the student loan process worked, but in essence, you get you know money for 3% or something. And, um, and so that helped us underwrite inventory and I, I would stack my classes to being two full days, like Tuesday, Thursday from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So I could spend Monday, Wednesday, Friday focused on the business. And it was a scented nail polish business. And I'd fly around the country and I'd meet with retailers and paint people's nails. And it would smell like chocolate or roses or. So what made you think that that was going to like what? What in you were like, okay, scented nail polish is going to be the thing? Was just instinct or how did you even figure that out? No, she, she, she was actually the one who was painting her nails and she said, the stuff doesn't smell great. And then she started working on formulas and I said, you know, this is really interesting. I bet you could crack the code on how to formulate this. There's a market for this. And she worked through various formulation versions of it. And we would test it on people. And then we just started figuring out how to make it. And we did it. She, um, she just was like a really smart chemist. I mean, that's where she started her background. And frankly, all the people I've had the privilege of working with over the years, building businesses have had a creative inspiration or have been a like what I would call an a widget creating ex that I can see the monetization path for that and say, hey, we could take this and build it out here or we could build out here. It's not it, it's never one person coming up with an idea. It's literally like you and I sitting here and saying, hey, you know what? You know what would be interesting? And then riffing off each other and then building out a business and then asking ourselves, is it really viable spending time, you know, with people we trust, asking them if they think it's viable and then putting the first type of product together, the deck, and then really the secret sauce, I think is just being bullish enough to believe in yourself and go in front of a customer and pitch it as if you know, it's happened already. And that's really the secret, right? Like, of course, you're going to buy this. Of course he thinks into nail polish is You can't live without it, yeah. So, I mean, the the beauty market is heavily, heavily oversaturated. How does, you know, how does Hatch Beauty, how do you cut through? How do you break through all of that noise? I think we have the trust of our retail partners, right? So from the very beginning, I think we've always acted as collaborative uh, strategic partners in every conversation. I truly have never entered a room with a bag of tricks, hoping I can sell someone something. It's never, ever been that, that approach, you know, let me pull things out of my bag. Will you buy this from me? And in general, I think that that the spirit of, of service being a service oriented heart 
by virtue of who you are and really, really seeking to understand someone's challenges and figuring out if you can find a way to a path for a solution is the, is the catalyst to success in any business, right? And uh, I think Hatch Beauty has had the trust of the customer base that we work with. Mm -hmm. one, one customer after another going to them and being a problem solving uh, person or group of a team, strategic thinking, experts and helping them find a path to getting somewhere they need to be faster, better, smarter, more successfully, more profitably. <clears throat> and um, we've been doing this 11 years. We moved into ingestibles about two years ago. Um, and this year we just launched with Kate Upton as my business partner on a brand called Found Active and for young moms on the go. It's both topical and ingestible. Amazing. And then um, with Kamora Lee Simmons and her daughter Ming and Aoki, we're relaunching Baby Fat, which is a legacy brand. Oh, yeah. you, know, you wow. probably know. Take me back to my my high school days. <laughs> I know, and they're not only is Kamora an incredible woman and a superstar powerhouse businesswoman herself, but her two daughters, one goes to Harvard, one goes to NYU. They're models. They're articulate. They're very much get out the vote focused. Mm -hmm. So they're really about being involved in uh, the process of speaking up and, and they're beautiful women. And it just is a privilege to get to kind of see Kamora hand over. Pass the torch. Talent yep. and yeah, support her daughters in building their empire with her. So it's been fun. So, so they're relaunching baby fat, which I think there's so many, it's funny to see now, uh, especially when the, you know, the Gen Z kids are having, uh, the clothes that I wore in the nineties, <laughs> like they're wearing, they're wearing filas, they're wearing, and I'm just like, this is so, it's so surreal to see what is the latest trend in beauty? Oh my gosh. It is so true. Um, my daughter, you know, it's hysterical. She's 11. She's like, loves run DMC. She loves Snoop Dogg. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, this is really happening. Um, the trend right now in beauty, I would say from a color cosmetic perspective, it's being your real self. So not being overly done, right? So natural beauty where you look like you're the no makeup makeup look. Um, I think that there's a huge opportunity in sexual wellness and sexual empowerment product for women, especially. Um, and I think that that's an, an up and coming opportunity that we're certainly um, exploring. Um, and then obviously wellness and ingestibles, people are really paying attention to uh, these ways in which they can optimize their health. Mm -hmm. and be smart about gut health, focus, mental acuity, stress, sleep. You know, these are the things that stress people out um, about their day-to-day -day is if they're taking care of their bodies. And so in external, internal, you know, and I think 360 approach to living well is a big a big opportunity for the space to continue to expand. It's funny you say the natural, obviously people wanting to look natural, but I, I've always wondered why these makeup tutorials are so popular as well if with people like doing, you know, crazy, crazy, you know, the Jeffree stars of the world and all of those people who are doing this crazy makeup. But then, you know, most girls are going for the natural look. So it's always, I'm always confused by that. What do you prefer? I prefer. Do you like a woman who's made up? No. Like you like, you prefer the natural look. I prefer a natural look. Yeah. Even on a Friday night, date night? Yeah, on a Friday night. Yeah, go for it. But I'm just saying, I feel like for me, like you're eventually, you're eventually going to see the reality anyways. And for, and like, I appreciate whoever I'm with. So I would want to embrace that. But if you want to get made up, I'm not going to say no. Um, speaking of makeup, I have a friend of mine who was talking about tattooing her lips and I'm just like, it freaks me out. So I want to know your, I want to get your take on, on permanent makeup. 
I, you know, I've, I've not ever had that experience. Um, I have a lot of girlfriends who do it, especially the eyeliner. Mm. I, I, I never am a big fan of permanent anything. Yeah. Right. I, I like, I think, you know, skin doesn't always stay where it's supposed to. And as it's coming and going and tucking and plucking, and <laughs> I just want to be able to apply what, what belongs where. That's my person. But, um, you know, there's the eyebrow, you know, inking your eyebrows and filling those in. You know, the reality is it's all in how we feel. Like I'm a huge proponent of the mommy makeover, which is what you do as a female, as a woman, if you choose to, after you have a few kids, you can get your butt, you get all your body parts put back and and in some cases better. (laughs) And, um, And, you know, I think that that's mission critical, you know, for me, that's, that was one of the best choices I ever made. I highly recommend it. Mm. Um, So I think whatever makes you feel really good is really important. Is there a trend that from a business perspective, you may have passed on that you've ever regretted? Um, Not really. I mean, here's the thing is this is a business that it it is, it it can be difficult if you're too, too early, Mm. right? So weirdly men's grooming started what, 20 years ago with some very cool brands like Jack Black and Zur. And, and honestly, you couldn't sell a men's grooming brand to save your life. And then I got the privilege to, to be introduced to Mike Dubin from Dollar Shave Club, Mm -hmm. you know, in 2011. Brilliant advertising. Such a visionary. Brilliant. Do you know Mike? Uh, I don't know him personally, but the, I just am obsessed with their marketing and their advertising. But it's also his magic sauce, right? He's just an individual who's okay to fail. Mm-hmm. He's okay to be goofy. He's a brilliant human. Um, and I just had the privilege of getting to know him and work with him in 2011 when everybody said, oh, this is never going to work you know, nobody is going to buy shaver, you know, shaving product from direct mail. Mm -hmm. No one's going to buy their razors from a subscription service. And Mike's like, I think I would, man. I'm like, I'm a dude. I just want, you know, stuff to show up on my doorstep so I can use it. Like, and I remember him coming to me and saying, Trace, I have a vision for this butt wipe. I want it to tingle. I want my asshole to tingle. What do you think? And I was like, I think that sounds amazing. <laughs> I wish that I had seen this conversation firsthand. Someone walking, I just want my asshole to tingle. And you're like, I think it should tingle. That's a great idea. <laughs> it was like how, you know, we use. How do we achieve this? <laughs> want it to be fresh. So I thought, what a great idea. So we got the privilege of working with him on the first, you know, butt wipe. And those are the kinds of things that in beauty, you know, for all the things that we may have passed on, you know, we really did a lot of things right too. And, you know, you just have to kind of like the person you're working with and think you can imagine being the consumer and say, yeah, would would every guy I know want to use a mint, pepperminty, tingly butt wipe? Yeah, probably. <laughs> they may not admit it outwardly, but right. they do. Right? They do. Correct. <laughs> you learned something new today. I love it. I, I didn't even know there were tingly butt wipes. Now I'm curious. Now I'm like, you know, I think I need tingly butt wipes in my <laughs> Right. What did you, so what did you learn about your business during COVID? Cause obviously, you know, 2020 was quite the year. Um, what did it teach you? Wow. Wasn't it the year? You know what, Dean, I was in Oman for 10 days last February right now on a spiritual retreat. Mm. I went to spend 10 days learning about Sufism and ecstatic dance and Tantra and meditation. And it was unbelievable. It was so magical. And I remember unplugging for that period of time because I didn't want to be, um, you know, I didn't want to be 
distracted with work. And I remember the last day before I was leaving to get back on the airplane to fly back to the United States. And there was this news alert that said this COVID thing had popped up in hot spots in Italy and in Iran. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hot spot? What's a hot spot? That doesn't sound good. Hot spot sounds bad. I wonder what that means. <laughs> and this time last year, I flew from Oman to Istanbul, Istanbul to LA. I had no mask on. I was, you know, no one in the, on the plane had masks on. And I remember thinking hotspot and my, I texted my, I WhatsApp my girlfriend in Shanghai and said, Hey, what's up with this hotspot? She said, Trace, batten down the hatches. Shit's going to hit the fan. You are in big, like a tsunami's coming. The shore is empty. You have no people on the beach. You don't see any waves because the wave is coming. It's so big. It's going to be like, it's going to wipe you out. Get ready. Get your seatbelt on. So I called my team and I said, what do we have on order right now for hand soap components? Mm -hmm. And they said, we have, you know, a million units of pumps or something. And I said, quadruple it, quadruple it. Get, get as many pumps on order as we can get because I had lived through SARS and H1N1, right? In 2010. And I remember we sold hand soap and hand sanitizer like it was going out of style. Mm. So literally at the end of February, we quadrupled all of our packaging purchase orders. When I got back in early March, we called our clients and said a few of our retailers and said, Hey, we have hand soap and we're going into major production. Do you need anything? And everybody was like, ah, we're fine. Everything's good over here. We don't need anything. And I said, well, in two weeks you're going to, and we have a lot of it. We have a lot of it. And so we were really so lucky because COVID was exactly to plan. We, from a revenue perspective, we were at our pre COVID revenue forecast. Uh, it was not all the product that we had forecasted selling. So we certainly had to pivot in terms of assortment, but we were, I think if our retailers were listening to this and weighing in, I think every retailer we work with would say we were incredibly agile partners in helping them satisfy a need that they couldn't get from a lot of the large CPG companies mm -hmm. because they ran out of inventory or didn't have enough reaction time. So we were by the end of March up and running, producing millions of units of hand sanitizer <clears throat> and hand soap because we had all the parts and pieces we needed to produce and support that business. And so it was quite a successful year for us. That's amazing. I mean, that one phone call, <laughs> it's, a, it's amazing. If you hadn't had that phone call, I love that you went from completely unplugging, talking about Sufism, and then you plug in and the world is literally about to fucking explode. <laughs> and, I know, you, and you I made know. the smart, yeah, you made the smart decision to go, okay, let's double down on this. It was so fast what happened. And you know, it's weird to think, Dean, like this time last year, this was about two weeks before the mass toilet paper sellout, right. remember? Oh yeah. Like right now we were sitting pretty, remember? We were like, oh, toilet paper's out of our ears everywhere. And then three weeks from today, couldn't find a roll of toilet paper or a sanitary wipe or a hand That's sanitary. when you needed the butt wipes right there. That's, <laughs> that would have come in handy. The, the tingly butt wipes would have come in handy for that one. Right? Oh. So that was your business. What did you learn about yourself or your family? How did you operate with your family? Um, I think it's a blessing. Honestly, I've never had much. I couldn't have imagined having so much quality time with the kids. Mm -hmm. I think we all, you know, it's so funny just getting on this call with you today. You know, this time last year, if you had said to me, we're going to zoom, I would have been like, Oh, got to call my it guy. I think I've had to do that. <laughs> oh man, the zoom. And how lucky are we that we got this great time? Like, I know what my kids are good at at school. I know what they don't, what they're not good at. We ate every meal together. Um, the quality time has been paramount, especially 
Atlas is so young. My son Atlas is so young that like to really have those formative, real formative first almost, you know, year and a half of his life of, you know, he's two and a half. So literally half of his life was spent during the COVID time. But being able to be there, I went from working, you know, 60 hours a week, you know, in hospitality to having all this free time. And it was the, the greatest gift ever. I completely agree. Ever. Right. It's ever. And honestly, you're about to enter the most fun period of time. I think three to five yeah. is magic. It is so much fun. So what you've done by virtue of what just happened with COVID is you've established a new precedent in your family experience of how much time you're willing to give up doing something else. It's so funny to your point. Yeah, I won't. I was like thinking about going back to that that job and, and consulting and I was like for the the time that I'm doing it and when I'm getting in return versus being able to have that quality time with my son it just doesn't it's not worth it it's not worth it and I, I wouldn't have seen that uh had it not been for the all the craziness in the world a hundred percent I think that the thing that I appreciate is the family time and the thing that I also appreciate is how much I appreciate the people in my life and what it means to me to have these relationships. I was um, spending time with someone in New York who I really had deep feelings for and this time last year and just the distance and trying to travel and get back and forth and the inability to make that connection work also was a complete reset, right? And, and yet I'm, I look back and now I'm so happy with my life at this point, just being satisfied with being in LA, you know, not needing to be on an airplane every single week. I don't feel like I have to rush and be in person in a meeting to be effective. And so the whole recalibration <clears throat> of how we see the world, I think has changed. And I think it's positive. I think it's a positive change. Yeah, I mean, the fact that you would have to, you know, either be here or in studio or like you said, going flying and taking meetings when you can hop on a Zoom call and achieve most of it. You know, I'm sure there's still pitching and things that you would want to do in person just to have that feel. But it's made everyone realize, oh, yeah, this could have been a Zoom. And then we realize it's not even a Zoom. It could have been an email. <laughs> and then maybe maybe a text, just like a follow up. <laughs> right. We're wasting a lot of time in transit. Yeah. Right. Right. So and we're doing other things. Are you going to, I know you're, so you're launching your podcast next week. Um, are you going to be doing that in person? Are you going to do it over Zoom? How are you going to lay that out? And what's the... I, I'm going to do as many as I can over in person. Awesome. I feel so connected, you know, to the in-person experience. But I also recognize that there's some aspects of limitation there. Um I, I, my, my purpose in this is really to connect women to other women in an inspirational way that allows them to see behind the curtain on how the sausage is made and, and literally what it took to, to get there and that it's not all just falling into place with ease, but that there is intention and that there are a whole fan club of other women rooting them on, even if they don't know them personally, that there's this collective vibration of support and, and momentum. And we're here to spread that conversation out. And it inspires and fires up and over helps women overcome some of the obstacles or fears that they may have that they can't do it or that they're not enough. Yeah, what would be the first thing, the, the one thing that you could just tell young entrepreneur, young female entrepreneur, what is that first piece of advice that you'd want to give? Um, I think, uh, it, well, I, I, I would always ask a woman uh, entrepreneur, why is she doing it? Mm. First of all, getting really, really clear about your purpose and your intention reason for why. So getting clear about that is key. And then if we decide that that's really what it is, then figuring out how to visualize your success and then feel it as if it's already happened mm. is literally the magic of it. 
But first, uncovering your reason for why your intention is so mission critical. And, and everyone has different reasons for why. I, I find a lot of women, women's reason for why is the freedom to decide their own schedule so that they can also be mothers and have family and raise their children and be present. And so if the reason for why is being having more time, then it's really important to have a jurisdiction schedule in your, in your calendar. And sometimes being an entrepreneur doesn't mean having a lot of time, right? So quite the opposite, especially when you're, when you're working like you were doing before going to school on certain days and then doing it at night. And that's, I think that's the thing that a lot of people aren't, don't understand that it, they just think that they're going to stop doing their day job and it's just going to happen and they're just going to work on this and it has, they have no revenue stream and they don't realize that bills still have to be paid and you can dream big, but you still have to have the work ethic to be able to, to carry it through. Totally. So what's your why? My why? Yeah. Um, my why for my first 25 years was, or 20 years was probably uh, fear in needing to feel money, to feel like money was security. So I, I felt like if I could create money, I could create safety. I could create wealth. I could create safety. Mm. To me, it was around never having to rely on someone to provide for me and feeling like I was independently able to sustain and grow. And somehow I thought financially, financial success meant freedom and safety and <laughs> that illusion <laughs> been there yeah right have you been there oh yeah I, I mean i went through a nasty divorce i was married to someone who was a you know, very big celebrity we lived a very crazy life and all the money in the world wouldn't have saved that relationship all of the money in the world right. wouldn't have made her happy or me happy or there was a lot of a lot of things that I realized I wasn't doing. Um, I'd lost myself. I had you know started putting all my energy into her, and then you, no amount of money could have made me feel secure because I wasn't doing what I loved. I wasn't following my passion. Right, exactly. So, and would you, if you could, could would you redo it if you could, or would you have done what you did? I feel like it's so hard. To, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and I don't think. I would be the person I am today having not gone through that. So, you know, every like going to that sliding, you know, sliding doors kind of metaphor, it all has led me right back to here. So who knows if I have done it differently, I may have been in a different situation. I may not have my son Atlas the way, you know, there might be, you know, every, everything changes everything. So I think that I'm happy with who I am today and, um, I wouldn't go back and do it any differently because it taught me a lot about myself and it was very defining for my character. A hundred percent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so who and are there, there is collateral damage, right? Oh, I mean, right. there is always in some way, shape or form. But when I think about the size of my bank account being at one level versus another, was I happier with you know, this amount of money versus that, or I actually, I was probably a hundred times more unhappy with much, much more money in my bank account than I would be, you know, with a lot less and just being in the moments that I'm in. Well, now you're, you're focused on your emotional bank account. hundred <laughs> percent. So who are your heroes? Oh my gosh. Do you want to see my vision board? I will bring out my vision. Board. I love it. I have um, Michelle Obama and Oprah Winfrey are like my two epic. Uh, and of course, Gail, I can't, I can't say Oprah without Gail. Cause I mean, I think Gail is as inspiring as Oprah and Michelle, but those three women, if someone said to you table for six, you're one. Uh, and so you have five seats to, to fill. Um, those three would for sure be at the table with me. Um, so what amazing, amazing women. I am inspired <clears throat> by those stories of women who 
have nothing and have made something something huge of themselves, mm -hmm. right? Those are my biggest, <clears throat> um, the privilege that I have of talking to some of the women on this podcast and how they built their personal empires and what they've, they've become is mind boggling to me. Like Sarah Blakely, I remember being in the green room with her at QVC 20 years ago. I was there selling spray on aerosol based spray on hosiery. And Sarah was there with her hot pants on and she had this brand called Spanx and she, she was, you know, in the green room. And of course, together, I, we were like besties that moment we met and I was, I said, what's a spank? And she said, oh my God, do you ever wear white pants and have like dimples on your butt? And I was like, of course, who doesn't? And she goes, well, take a look at my butt in these white pants and she sh and and her butt I thought looked amazing with the Spanx on or without I think she had a great butt anyway but she goes look at this butt I said I want to grab it it looks so good and she goes I have these things these Spanx things take a look you know it's those those women that I get to meet and spend time with that just completely light me up and Michelle is one of those, at least Alicia Keys. Mm. I have had the privilege of sitting with her and getting to know her story and of what a talent she is and what an amazing, amazing woman, like blows my mind. So talented. So talented and so heartfelt and so real. And so just like, I mean, I get teary thinking about her because she's just such an amazing human. So what a privilege I get to have on this podcast to talk to these incredible women. That's amazing. That's incredible. And you're launching that. That's next week, right? February 28th, right? 6th. 26th. Right. Oh, I'm mad. So February 26th. Yeah. Uh, I'm excited for that. And last but not least, what is your most treasured possession? What? One, is it literally one thing? You can give me more if you want, but you know, what are, what are your most treasured possessions? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, well, I guess my family home is my most treasured possession only because of the memories we've had here and the life we've built here. And, you know, being a single woman, raising three kids, I live in this family home, I've created a true home, right? So it's really about the creation of the feeling of what it means to be in this, in this home. It's not, it's not the house itself, although I do love it, but it's my probably my most treasured possession only because there's so much love pouring out the front door. It's like, I feel like, you know, the luckiest woman on the planet to be able to come in the front door and be in this home. I love that. I love that. Miss Tracy Holland, you are a badass inspiration. Uh, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. February 26th, February 26th, the Potential Powerhouse coming out. Super excited. From Potential to Powerhouse. Watching these women. Yeah, from Potential to Powerhouse. I love it. And you can hear these incredible stories of women who have made their journeys and what amazing badasses they are. How fun. I love it, I love it. Thank you so much for taking the time and uh, thank you. I definitely wanna chat with you again because you're a fascinating human. So thank you so much. I appreciate you.